Okay, uh, it is now my pleasure to invite our keynote speaker for this conference, Mr. Eric Frank, who is the co-founder and president of Flat World Knowledge, which will tell us about harnessing technology and innovation to break the iron triangle of access, cost, and quality in education. Eric, the floor is yours. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here with you um, today. It's my great pleasure uh, to return to Israel uh, to speak on a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I come from a number of years in educational publishing, uh, so much of what I'll, I'll talk about is, is perspective and opinion, um, uh, but informed, uh, hopefully, by uh, a long time with uh, uh, Pearson Education, uh, Thompson Cengage Education, and most recently uh, in my role as founder and president of Flat World Knowledge, uh, an open source college textbook publishing company. I think it's fair to say that education is the black gold of the 21st century. Those with access to education and to knowledge will continue to improve their condition in life, and those without it will continue to fall further behind. There are a few needs, if we think about it, for which more education cannot be effectively prescribed uh, to solve problems, whether that's uh, breakthroughs in medical science, eradication of poverty, eliminating intolerance, improvement of human rights around the world. All of these things and so many more of the, of the issues that affect the human condition, uh, I believe, are uh, positively affected by more people having more access to education. The faith in education worldwide is astounding. It may be the closest thing that we have to a global religion. And that religion of faith in education is winning converts at an unprecedented speed. If we look at it, in 1900, there were a half a million people worldwide engaged in some form of post-secondary education. 100 years later, in 2000, that number was 100 million. Just 10 short years later, that number is 153 million, and the rate of growth continues exponentially. I know in the United States, and I suspect it's similar in Israel and many other countries, education and access to post-secondary education in particular has become a ticket to the middle class. It's, it's part of the American dream, just like owning a home and now having a higher education for your children is part of that American dream, and that is for a good reason. If we look at real median earnings uh, by education level, the gap continues to grow between those with access to post-secondary education and those without. And it's not just about wages, but it's about quality of life. These are uh, uh, numbers from the US College Board, but they show that college graduates show higher levels of civic participation and volunteer work, have longer lifespans, better access to health care, greater job satisfaction, and a slew of other uh, benefits that accrue to those who have access to knowledge, information, and education. So I think given all of that, there are some things in life that are just plain obvious. I'll show you a few of them. That's pretty obvious. Obvious. That was on my hotel last night, actually. <laughs> and, and I think this one is obvious, that increasing access to education uh, is a must. It's a, it's a moral and economic imperative. The challenge we face is what I refer to as the Iron Triangle. There was a report in 2008 of presidents of colleges and universities in the United States in which they referred to the Iron Triangle of cost, access, in quality and the unbreakable relationship between those three things. Um, that if we want to increase access, then either we have to live with decreased quality or increased cost. And we can play these factors out any number of ways, but this is an unbreakable iron triangle. 
And I think what that report utterly failed to recognize was that in 2008, we live in the world in the age of the internet. And the internet absolutely, in my opinion, fundamentally breaks the Iron Triangle um, in, in, in meaningful ways. Many of you have probably seen this, this quote from Thomas Jefferson, but he talks about knowledge as an abundant good. If, if you have knowledge and I take it from you, I'm not taking it from you. I'm absorbing it and receiving it, but you retain that knowledge. So he said, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. He's saying knowledge is an abundant good. And I think what's unique about the internet and the transmission of knowledge materials through the internet is that is this. Uh, Dr. David Wiley, uh, Brigham Young University, and one of the global pioneers in uh, open education and a good friend and colleague, uh, chief openness officer at Flat World Knowledge said, for the first time in the history of humanity, external expressions of what we know are on an equal footing with knowledge itself. Like Jefferson's torch, both ideas and their expressions can now be given without being given away. And I think this is what fundamentally changes everything with regard to the internet. A more practical example from Dr. Wiley uh, was his own personal experience, the revelation of the power of this idea of knowledge as an abundant good and not a scarce good anymore. And that was that he would write programs for his little sister. In the day and age when, when you wrote a program, it couldn't be saved. Um, so you wrote the program and his little sister would play and then it would be gone and he'd have to write it again. Um, but he wrote her a simple calculator. And the recognition he had at that moment was that any number of people could access this calculator at, at the same time. And it's not the same anymore as that physical calculator that if he gave it to his sister, he couldn't use it. And he realized that that is such a simple but profound and powerful idea and that somehow that could be exploited uh, to improve uh, the human condition. So I think the big challenge we face is no longer technology. Technology is the infrastructure. It is the enabler. Um, it's old business models. Um, whether those business models are for-profit or not-for-profit, uh, that we have to challenge and that we have to break down and we have to rebuild anew on the principles of what the Internet offers us. I'm going to speak to that through the prism of the, the industry that I know best, uh, college textbooks. Um, and in the United States, college textbooks now average $176. Um, many introductory books exceed $200, and they've become a fundamental part of the cost challenge of students affording higher education. There's a fundamental value gap there, where students on the one hand, who are becoming increasingly technology savvy and connected, and a textbook on the other hand, which has fundamentally not changed much as a core product, other than it's gotten increasingly expensive and inaccessible to the average student. Students have reacted uh, in response to this by turning to the internet to find solutions, whether those are buying used books through channels on the internet, sharing books, uh, increasingly pirating books. And as a result, publishers at large have been selling less new copies of books every single year globally. And so they've been, as a response, increasing prices more. We have less customers buying our product. Our response to preserve our revenue is to increase prices faster. So prices have been increasing uh, at four times the rate of inflation in the United States and almost three times the rate of inflation globally. Uh, they've been revising editions of textbooks faster and faster to try to eliminate used textbooks from the market and bring out new textbooks so that they can get a one-time sale and recoup profit. And none of that is pedagogically sound or consumer friendly. If we look at it in the United States, it's, it's sort of shocking. Uh, tuition and fees at college, sorry, uh, have risen 240% uh, percent or the bottom line is uh, inflation over the same period of time. Um, and so college tuition and fees are skyrocketing. The cost of textbooks uh, is just behind it. The total economic pain to a student trying to go to college is substantial. And that pain is not evenly distributed. I know you don't have a similar system of higher ed here, uh, in, in this regard, but at the United States, 50% of students are in two-year community colleges. 
And if you're at a two-year community college and you're now paying X for college tuition, you're now paying 72% of X for your textbooks, or almost as much for textbooks as you're paying for your entire education. If you're at a four-year university, that number is 26% of X. Both of them shockingly high and inexcusable. And the problem goes deeper than just hitting the student in their pocketbook. Um, there's been some studies showing both in the United States and elsewhere that increasingly each year more students are foregoing the purchase of textbooks uh, because of economic factors. In a recent study in the United States, 70% of students said in the previous semester they chose not to buy a required textbook because of the cost of that textbook. And of that 70%, almost 80% of them said they knew it would hurt their grade in the course, or they believed it would hurt their grade in the course, but they made that choice anyway due to economics. And the Gates Foundation funded a study to assess why students were dropping out of college. And far and away, the two most significant reasons cited by students were these. Number one was I had to work as well, and it was too stressful trying to balance work and college. And the second was that the cost of textbooks and additional fees beyond tuition. I planned for tuition. I didn't realize I would have all these other expenses force me to work more hours or not purchase a book and fall behind in my coursework and ultimately make the decision uh, to, to drop out of college. So I could have shortened that whole thing to just say, in the textbook market, I think nobody is happy today. We have students who I think are frustrated angry faculty who feel like unwilling participants in a marketplace that's no longer working, institutions that have a mission to graduate more students with the same or less resources who are finding the cost, the rising cost of textbooks and their inaccessibility working against that mission, and authors who are actually getting paid less royalties year on year as they watch the market crumble and more and more students opt not to purchase new textbooks, which is their source of income and royalties. And so, because of all of that turmoil in the marketplace, we have a rapidly shifting landscape in the higher ed textbook market. I won't belabor this in, in much detail other than to say for years, of course, we, since Gutenberg, uh, we had print books. Um, and that state of, of condition lasted for a very long time. Um, uh, ultimately, we arrived probably sometime in the early 1990s with print books and bundled digital supplements, extra things, um, which we would put on CDs and put into textbooks. Those eventually made their way online. But this was a fairly slow process, about a 15-year um, process uh, to some degree, 10, 10 to 12-year process, until finally we started to see the launch of, of e-books in any kind of uh, uh, critical mass. But that sort of e-book 1.0 was really just a static replica. It was taking the content of a print book putting it online in something like a PDF format and saying it's now digital. And that was a step in the right direction. Um, eBooks 2.0, I think we're in the midst of today. And that is where uh, there's an attempt to say that the digital medium itself enables us to do much more. And so we can begin to integrate multimedia. We can integrate interactivity and other additional resources and begin to change the learning experience. But I think fundamentally those are still eBooks 1.0 with some bells and whistles, as I would, I would call them. I think it's really the eBooks 3.0 that we're beginning to see emerge now uh, that are going to begin to transform fundamentally what we know as the textbook into something very different. Um, whether that's a textbook that's uh, driven by assessment, and then as the student fails to perform up to a certain level on a particular item, uh, we're able to deliver them just the knowledge that they need uh, at that moment. Uh, and provide an adaptive pathway through a textbook, whether it can provide a pathway through a textbook based on different learning styles that, that it's been, uh, a student's been assessed to have. Um, we'll see a lot of different types of, of e-books, uh, I think, emerging. And I think one of the more compelling uh, movements globally is the movement around open education resources, um, and in this case, open textbooks specifically openly licensed materials uh, that fundamentally open up access globally to the knowledge contained within those materials uh, and radically change the business model of, of, of textbook publishing and course materials at large. And that's really where I'm going to spend the rest of my time, talking about free and open textbooks as an emerging global solution to uh, the crisis that I've outlined to this point. So we'll begin with a definition of what is open. It's a fundamental legal principle. So we live in a world of copyright. 
When a, a, a new work is created, be it a textbook, be it an image, be it a video, that work is copyrighted. And when it's copyrighted, the license under which it's published is an all rights reserved license. Whoever holds the copyright reserves all the rights to that material. And that system fundamentally served us quite well for many years in both academia, I think, and, and well beyond academia. The other end of the spectrum of the intellectual property rights spectrum was the public domain. If I, as a copyright holder, didn't want to reserve the rights to myself, I wanted to allow people to distribute it much more freely, to do more with it, my only choice was to put it in the public domain. And therefore, I have no rights <coughs> remaining anymore, which was a fairly unattractive uh, decision for most copyright holders to make. And so what happened was, as the internet became an increasingly critical medium for creating content, for interacting with content, for distributing content, legal scholars began to recognize that copyright law was falling far behind technology. And it was beginning to hold back what technology was potentially enabling. And so legal scholars at Stanford uh, and the Berkman Center at, at Harvard in particular um, uh, led by Larry Lessig came up with this idea of a middle ground, of a some rights reserved open license in between public domain and all rights reserved. And the, and the concept is really quite simple, that it's still a copyrighted work, but I want to make it available to the world, and I want to make it available under different circumstances and give more rights to people to do more with it. And those rights I characterize, and I've, I've borrowed this from, from Dr. Wiley, is sort of the five R's of open. The right to legally copy material, whether it's digital or physical material, and to reuse that material, to redistribute that material, to share it with anybody uh, who wants access to that material and to do so legally. To revise material, to be able to make changes, edit it, adapt it, tailor it to my particular needs. If I'm an instructor and I want to include examples uh, of things that I uh, have gathered over the years. I want to include case studies that it maybe I wrote, projects. Uh, I have the legal right to now do that. I can remix materials. I can take openly licensed materials from multiple sources and mix them together to create something new. All of this perfectly legal and enabled by the open license. And ultimately, the end user has a right to free access, some point of access at which they can get to that material and they can consume it at no cost to themselves. So I'm going to try to give you a brief case study of Flat World Knowledge, the company I founded, as a way of sort of saying concretely what can happen when you take ideas from publishing and ideas of open content and you put them together and build a business model around it. What's possible? And so when we started Flat World Knowledge uh, five and a half years ago, um, we made four fundamental bets. Uh, the first bet was that we had to produce great textbooks that nobody, students nor faculty, would be willing or should go backwards in terms of quality. So we had to maintain or improve quality. The second thing, though, was that we wanted to transfer control from us as the publisher to the local expert, the faculty member, who's really in the best position to know the subject, to know their students, and to know the best way to deliver the material to their students in particular. And so we wanted to be able to transfer control to the local expert to continue to adapt, rework, and improve the textbook. The third thing was we wanted to give far more choices to students. For that student who wants to read in print, fantastic. For that student who wants to read online through a browser, great. For the student who wants to read on their smartphone, on their Amazon Kindle device, their iPad, listen to it on their on MP3 player, a student who has print disabilities and struggles to read, all of them should have formats available to them uh, that suit their particular learning style. And the fourth bet was that we could do all of that by leveraging innovation and technology and new business models at a dramatically lower cost, thereby eliminating cost as a barrier to knowledge. And so what we do to achieve those four bets are these things. Number one, we, we're a publisher. So we still go out. We still sign the best experts in their particular field, many of them very successful textbook authors already, to write a new textbook uh, in, a, in an area that they are an expert in. We professionally develop it. There are editors, there are illustrators, there are designers, all the things that professional publishing brings to the table. And those books are fully supported with things like teaching supplements, instructor's manuals, test banks for learning management systems, customer service to help. So in this regard, we're a publisher. 
And this sort of puts one on the playing field uh, and allows you to compete, I think, but doesn't differentiate you uh, from what already exists. But bet number two was we could turn over control to the local experts. And that's where things begin to change. So we apply a Creative Commons open license, enabling users to have those five rights that I described earlier instead of a traditional all rights reserved license on our material. And we provide a technology platform online to actually enable faculty to easily make the kinds of changes they might want to make in order to tailor a book to their particular needs. And so I'll just give you an example of what that, what that experience looks like. So here's a, a typical introduction to business textbook. And perhaps I want to customize this book prior to using it in my class. And so I enter an editing environment where I can do things like rearrange content, edit content, insert new content. And so, for example, if I want to change the order of the materials, I simply drag and drop chapters and sections and put them wherever I want into the table of contents. If I want to delete material, I simply click a trash can and delete chapters or sections with a click. If I want to edit material specifically, I can go to that section, I can click on it, load it up in our editing environment, and change anything that I want by clicking. I can add new objects between things like paragraphs, bulleted lists, figures, documents, video clips. I can click on any existing paragraph and open up an editor and be able to make changes. I might want to insert a link to a reading. I might want to insert a local example. And I can add new content. So let's say that a professor in Israel saw this book and said, this is basic marketing, basic management, basic economics and accounting. This looks pretty good, um, but it doesn't feel local enough to me. Um, so I'm going to edit this book and add a new section to this chapter. And I'm going to call that section Israel Hotbed of Entrepreneurship. And I'm going to save that, and I'm going to begin building a new section of content. I'm going to start with some learning objectives, which I could cut and paste or type directly in here. Add a paragraph of content about um, something. And one of the nice things is you can see this example is from June of 2012 of Facebook buying a Tel Aviv-based facial recognition company for almost $100 million. I could have content in here from yesterday, um, and I could have it in my textbook today. Save that. I want to integrate a video about that particular company. I can go to YouTube. I find a video that's appropriate, uh, or Blip TV, put in a URL, and save it. And I now integrated that video into my book. And I'll finish my section that just takes me a few minutes to write by typing in some content, uh, some exercises for students about that video so they can apply what they just saw. And when I'm done and I click Save, what happens is that the content is immediately formatted to look like the rest of the textbook around it so that the user needs to know nothing about formatting. And you end up with a linear and cohesive looking experience with the sole exception being these bars here on the side in this particular case are indicating that this is Mio content, make it your own content that's been added. So that the student can differentiate between what was original from the author and what's been added or modified by their particular faculty instructor. When I'm ready to use the book in my class, I simply click publish. And what happens is a bunch of sort of magic in the background. Um, so I started with this expert book. I went into the editing environment and I made those changes. I click Publish, and the first thing that happens is everything renumbers. Table of contents renumbers, the index repaginates, everything is now linear and cohesive. And I then watch, and in a few minutes, all of the following formats that you see are, are created without any human intervention are, and are available to students. From HTML to PDF to EPUB and Mobi to DAISY and um, uh, BRF, which is digital braille formats, to audio formats, so that students can consume textbook content in the format of their choosing, from browser-based web books to soft cover books to PDFs to iPad versions to Kindle versions to accessible versions for students with print disabilities and to audio versions to be listened to. And the model for distributing all of that to students is to give them more choices than they've historically had. And of course, uh, the most disruptive one is a free choice. So students can choose to read the textbook that you were just looking at through their browser for free, the entire textbook. So anybody in the audience could go to the catalog at Flat World Knowledge, and you could read every textbook in that catalog. And we have, as I'll show you, millions of people from around the world doing that uh, all the time. Um, so choice number one, I want to read for free through the internet. But if I don't want to be on the internet, 
I want to be offline. I want to have it on my device when I get on the bus. I want to be able to sit outside in the sun with a physical book and read it. Um, for whatever reason I might choose, uh, we have lots of students who prefer alternative formats. So for a very low price, they can buy a print book, which is when they ordered it, and a file is sent. It's the unique file created by their professor with all of those changes to a printer who prints it on demand and ships it directly to that student. And they now have a customized book days after their professor has modified it for $35 US, which is um, about uh, one quarter uh, to one seventh or of the price of a traditional book. Or they can buy a digital pass, which provides them with access to all the different digital formats that I described a moment ago, including um, digital study aids like flashcards, quizzes, and audio study guides. So they can buy a bundle of offline digital formats uh, for the same price of $35. Students are saving about $80 per student per class on average uh, and are getting, I think, significantly more value for significantly less money. Um, a second model that's interesting and in, in growing is colleges and universities directly licensing our portfolio of content for students on a course basis. And so a professor selects a textbook and then with, and there's an agreement with the university where that textbook is now built into the cost of a course for somewhere in the $20 to $25 range. And through the learning management system, students click a, a link, and through single sign-on, they access a, um, all of the different textbook formats. And they can pick and choose whatever formats they want to use throughout the semester. I think it's fair to say that um, evidence so far, uh, it's not conclusive yet, is that it is indeed possible to build a textbook publishing model on a radically different basis than what uh, we've seen generally to date. As a company, we have over 150 world-leading authors um, writing textbooks for flat world knowledge exclusively, 20 universities who are licensing content at some significant scale now, over 3,000 professors who have individually chosen to adopt a flat world knowledge textbook as their uh, primary textbook in this semester that we just completed. Over 270,000 students in this past semester uh, uh, being um, users of flat world knowledge textbooks in formal classes where books have been adopted. Some of the adoptions are coming from places uh, like Carnegie Mellon, uh, Princeton University, MIT, and others indicating that it is indeed possible for some of the top premier institutions in the world to adopt uh, textbooks under this open model. And I think um, what's amazing to me, and it, it amazes me every day, is to watch what's happening around open content. We have 270,000 students in formal classes using the material, but in that same period of time, which was um, August 1st to December, I'm sorry, it was uh, January 1st to June 1st, and that semester that we completed in the spring, where we had 270,000 students in classes, we had another 1.5 million readers coming from all over the globe to just learn on their own. I, I pulled the, some numbers of the top 25 um, uh, countries accessing content and the number of visits, and it was just shocking. Uh, 92,000 visitors from India, uh, 11,000 from Kenya, 9,200 from Indonesia, 6,600 from Nigeria, 6,000 from Jamaica. Um, and if you look at all of the countries, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, and it turns out that we had, uh, during that semester, visitors from 215 countries, including our, our friend there down at the bottom, Mayotte, in the long tail, one visitor. Uh, but amazing to see the global demand. We haven't marketed, we haven't spent a dime trying to tell anybody in the world uh, about flat world knowledge, and yet people are starting to learn that knowledge is out there, it's available, and they're demanding it in huge numbers. And, and looking at traffic, uh, since June, uh, we're expecting to see that 1.5 million uh, probably triple in the uh, fall semester. Uh, and so, um, uh, amazing access to knowledge all over the world. Um, we've raised $30 million in venture capital uh, in the past couple of years. Um, I think that's significant for two reasons. One, it's saying that the investment community is seeing a radically new model emerging and is putting money behind it and saying we think that the uh, intellectual property basis of publishing and the business model of publishing is indeed changing. Um, and, and interestingly, two of our investors, um, Bertelsmann and Random House, uh, are the largest publishing companies in the world. Um, and so big publishing is starting to recognize a shift in the industry as well uh, and is starting to uh, put money behind where they see potentially 
uh, the business going. Um, Outsell is an industry uh, analyst firm for Wall Street that analyzes trends um, for investors. And every year they publish a, a 30 companies to watch around the globe for uh, the potential to transform an industry. Uh, in 2011, Flat World Knowledge was one of those 30 companies along with Google, Facebook, and Apple. Um, and so I think, again, all indications that from different angles, uh, real change is afoot. And I think most importantly, if we come back to where we started, um, are, are students doing better? Does this actually change educational outcomes in any meaningful way? And so the University System of Ohio, one of the largest systems of universities in the United States, 37 public institutions, about uh, 500,000 students in that system, um, has partnered with us and is beginning to use uh, uh, more and more uh, open textbooks. And they're doing it as part of a strategic plan. They have a 10-year plan to increase affordability, enrollments, retention, and ultimately graduation rates of students in the state of Ohio. And they've recognized that providing textbooks in affordable digital formats is part of that strategic plan. A study was just done by the chancellor's office in that system of students who were using open textbooks. 91% thought they were more cost effective, which I think is, is fairly obvious. But 78% said the experience of using those books, they were saving a lot of money, was actually more engaging um, than using traditional textbooks that they had used prior. Cerritos College is a, a, a college 25,000 students in, uh, outside of Los Angeles, California. Um, they had a theory, and their theory was that if students are dropping out of courses because of the cost of books, if we remove cost as a barrier, our hypothesis is we should have more students stay in courses. Is it true? And so they piloted open textbooks in three of their introductory courses and did a fairly rigorous assessment of that. And the president of that college wrote an article in the journal, and you can see the results here, that the retention rate was 90.2%, a 10 to 15% increase in the number of students completing each of those courses simply by switching a textbook. And at Virginia State University, where poverty is rampant and 90% of the students are on some form of, of government aid to be able to afford and attend college, they had assessed that 55% of their students were no longer purchasing textbooks and they needed to intervene. They did, and they started using open textbooks in all of their required business curriculum and um, uh, published this article that indicated that more students are staying in their courses and the ones taking advantage of multiple formats are actually earning a full grade point average higher. Um, they recently published a formal study on this and, and demonstrated that they too showed a 15% increase in retention of their students and a 20% improvement in the grade point average of students using the open textbooks. So where's all this going? Um, I have no idea. Um, it sort of changes on a daily basis, but I think one thing that's critical is research at scale. These early numbers are compelling. Um, they're important, but they're not uh, statistically meaningful yet. Um, and so uh, we're engaged with some third parties um, to uh, really try to conduct research at scale, involve about 250,000 students uh, using open textbooks to figure out three things. One, uh, sort of tier one, student and faculty perceptions. Do they like them better? What's their experience? But tier two, more interestingly, is that student success metrics, um, grade point average, retention, persistence, completion. Uh, and then ultimately, number three, I think, is going to be the most interesting which is to really assess student behavior with the material and to see if we can't start to correlate some of the behaviors with the material with this success. So beyond just I have access to it and therefore I'm doing better than those who don't, um, what am I doing with it? And are there patterns of things that I'm doing with the material that make me more successful than others? So I think we'll see a lot of research over the next six months uh, around those three things. Um, I think product is continuously changing and we'll see a lot more uh, integrated assessment um, so that as you're, as you're reading, you can do more assessment of yourself and your absorption of knowledge, um, which both gives you immediate feedback about what you know and you don't know, but it also gives us uh, much more feedback about where content might be weak. And so we can create iterative feedback loops to continuously improve content and see if performance on those embedded assessments goes up. And it can also give instructors in a course a lot more data and information about what students are and are not absorbing uh, in the course as they read through the material. 
I think we'll see a lot more sharing on the platform, opening up the platform to allow people to create lots more um, uh, learning objects around textbooks and sharing them with other users um, so that it becomes a marketplace of, of ideas and resources around core open textbooks uh, with lots more user-generated content. And I think that ultimately we'll see um, uh, something like Flat World, if it's not Flat World, I think we'll see somebody like Flat World creating a broader OER or open education resource platform um, where it's not just published books by Flat World Knowledge, but it also becomes a curated center of high quality open education resources from around the globe um, that as they're absorbed, they're brought up to a certain level of quality. Supplements for instructors are built out around them, and the volume of open content that's at the highest quality uh, on, a, on a usable platform continues to um, uh, improve and, and increase. And I think most importantly from a business model point of view is to take all of that global traffic and begin to formalize uh, a global business and all of the opportunity that there is around the world uh, for people who are demanding more and more access to education. So I want to conclude sort of my formal remarks and leave time to have some conversation for a few minutes and answer any questions um, with a reminder, I think, that when we fall into the trap of believing that there is an iron triangle, uh, we need to remind ourselves that the internet fundamentally breaks uh, this old paradigm. And I think the um, imperative to figure out uh, what we can now do is essential. If I think about my children, they're seven and five now, and in the increasingly complex and, and arguably more dangerous world um, that they're living in uh, compared to the one that I grew up in, and I think about all of the, the problems facing their generation and, and, and the generation that will be their children, and I think that only 6.7% of the people in the world who have amazing capacity to create. Only 6.7 have access to higher education today. And with the technology that we have available, I find that number sad and inexcusable. And if I think about who's going to solve cancer, who's going to solve the big problems that I know my children are going to face, climate change, and I think whether the answer is going to come from the 6.7% of people or the 93.3% of people who don't have access to higher education, I know I can sleep better at night knowing that if we can get more and more of that 93.3% into higher education, that we will find solutions to problems that we thought were insoluble. And all of us will live in a better, safer, and happier world. So with that, I'll conclude and open it up to conversation and questions, and I'm happy to just take questions. Yes? Sure. And my second question is, uh, what do you have, or what do you think about uh, interactivity with the students? It seems, uh, in my world, it's, it looks, it's very impressive uh, how much interactivity does it allow in regards to uh, uh, questions that can be automatically answered, forums, discussions, and Great question. So, uh, two questions were one, um, how many students actually take advantage of purchasing versus reading for free? And secondly, um, uh, how much interactivity is there um, and what's possible? Um, so with regard to the first one, today about 52% of our users actually purchase something and 48% uh, read entirely for free. Um, of the 52% who are purchasing something, the most common purchase today still is a text, uh, physical textbook. Um, we produce them in both black and white and color, and it's interesting to see that 97% of students who buy a print textbook buy black and white. 
um, and 3% by color, uh, which says that they simply don't see the value in color relative to the extra dollars uh, that that costs. Um, the second most significant um, group of purchasers are um, students now purchasing EPUB and MOBI formats, um, so we're using EPUB and MOBI formats. And so um, uh, we can see the increase in the number of students with handheld devices, uh, and we're starting to see a fairly quick rise in the number of, of those purchases. Um, that works for us from a business model point of view because we don't have used books. I mean, I think that's the sort of big business model so, uh, conundrum that's been solved is if you look at a traditional publisher, they sell a book one time, get paid for it and pay their author's royalties, and then that same book will be reused in a used or shared format or a rented format uh, four or five more times. Uh, whereas what we have is a lower number of buyers at a lower price point, but much more consistently over time. Uh, and so we're therefore we're able to actually pay our authors uh, equal or greater royalties uh, than we were paying them when I worked in the traditional industry. Um, from the point of view of interactivity, I think one of the um, uh, nice things about, uh, uh, about this is that it really changes the book from a book to a learning platform. And just about anything is possible. Uh, what we do today is we integrate uh, multimedia, uh, and we're beginning to integrate those um, uh, assessment items directly into the material. So uh, one can stop, do exercises, get immediate feedback, and then link back to material in the book. Um, but there's no reason why uh, one can't actually build social functionality around that as well. It's been on our roadmap for some time, uh, hard to get to, but we're, we're starting to finally get there uh, so that students can connect to other students within their class, they can connect to other readers of that same book uh, around the globe, uh, they can ask questions of other students, they can engage in study sessions, chat, uh, and I think you'll see all of that kind of social learning functionality surrounding content over the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, one of the um, things that's, uh, I think, wonderful about open licensing and open content is that the owner of that copyright is now giving permission uh, and enabling people to reuse that material. And I, I actually think it's quite um, uh, wasteful of, of uh, people's time, energy, resources, and intellect uh, to take basic concepts, for example, and have to rewrite those because they've been copyrighted somewhere. I think what's much more um, compelling is to open up the uh, creativity of humans around the world and say, here's all the basic core stuff. Now spend your energy and your time on the, on the new things, on the things that you might be a real expert in or the individual insights or perspectives that you have. And to legalize that, uh, I think, is really important. Now, it doesn't... Um, I, I think one of the things to... to um, be clear about is it shouldn't, uh, plagiarism is plagiarism. Plagiarism is using somebody else's material without attribution. And, and most open licenses still require attribution. So, so long as uh, a student is attributing uh, the source of their, their work to uh, uh, the appropriate source, uh, then I think open licensing enables a whole world of creativity uh, that was precluded uh, prior to open licensing. Um, it doesn't make plagiarism uh, okay. Uh, good question. So 35% of the books that were used in the past semester had been modified uh, in some capacity by the instructors teaching those courses. And, and we're seeing that number grow pretty rapidly. So um, uh, our expectation is it'll be 50% uh, or more uh, next semester. So as users get comfortable with the idea that they can change things, uh, they begin to uh, experiment. I, I had a funny experience with uh, somebody. I, I mentioned Cerrito Co Cerritos College. 
and the department head who's been leading up the charge to adopt more and more uh, textbooks in that department, they now use 33, um, never changed anything. So all 33 were as, as they were. And so I was sitting with him one time and I said, how come you haven't changed anything? And he said, I have all kinds of ideas uh, about what we want to do, but I haven't had time. And um, we were sitting there and, and, and then he said to me, hey, by the way, though, I have a quick question. Uh, I, I do want to change this title of this chapter because it drives me crazy. Well, how do I do that? And I said, click it. So he clicked it. And, and, I, and he said, what do I do now? I said, just type your title. And he typed it and he clicked save. And there it was in the book. And he was so amazed uh, by this simple thing that now almost all the books have been customized. And so I think that there's sort of a, a gap we're going to have to get over where, where people don't recognize the power that they have at their fingertips. Um, but as they do, uh, they'll continue to dabble and experiment and create. So there's, there's no charge unless, um, in, in model number one that I described, unless a student decides to buy a, a saleable format. So um, the only time anybody gets charged is when a student purchases one of those saleable formats. In the second model, um, the institution does license the content from us. Um, and so in that model, uh, they're paying, in essence, for 100% of the students in a class. And in exchange, they're collecting the money from tuition and turning around and paying us a piece of that. So in the licensing model, yes. If I want to be practical, uh, for example, Tel Aviv University wants to use one of your books published by Blackwell Knowledge in economics. They can just tell the students, this is the course textbook, use it for free. Or if you want to buy, then... Right. So basically what happens is the instructor goes to the site, reviews the book, uh, says, this is good, I want to use it, clicks a button that says adopt, fills out about three pieces of information, and that creates a link on our site. So when a student from Tel Aviv University goes to the site, they can search by Tel Aviv University, their professor, their course, click a button, and then have access to uh, the textbook for that class. And if it's been customized, that's the way we ensure they get to the appropriately customized book for, for their instructor. It's HTML through a standard web. So we've built a web-based reader that can be read through any standard browser, and it's presented as HTML through that web-based browser. Yeah, sure. The question was, is there any um, uh, thought about moving into secondary education or even primary education, I guess one could ask, um, uh, even though the conditions in that market are quite different, which is true. Um, I know, um, I think there's a lot of challenges um, that um, uh, people face in secondary education. I know in Israel, parents are paying for the books, and so there's still an economic challenge uh, around textbooks. Um, and I think as people try to solve that problem, in the United States, schools are paying. And s budgets for education have been um, going down during the recession, so there's less money to buy books. And so what schools do in the United States is they use them longer. So they used to use them seven years, which was absurdly long. Now they're moving to eight and nine years to try to pay for them. So I think there's a, a real need for um, uh, up-to-date, current, dynamic content affordably in that marketplace. Um, flat world knowledge probably won't do that. I think our view of the world is there's more opportunity globally in higher education first. Um, but I think there are other players. There's a company called CK, or nonprofit called CK12 um, that's doing this in, in secondary education. Uh, and I think that we'll see uh, more and more entrepreneurial activity uh, in this space. And I think a lot of that will probably be focused on secondary education. Um, so the question was, do we have thoughts about doing any other language besides English? Yeah, I think we do. Um, I, I think the platform actually supports a huge number of languages. And so, I mean, I've actually played around with going to, to Google Translate uh, and translating our books and our entire website. And it's not bad. It's shockingly, uh, you know, I've had some people review the output and say that it's probably 85 to 90% of the way accurate. Um, so I, I think that... Um, uh, the answer is yeah. I mean, I think that we are um, probably uh, initially focused on Spanish and Portuguese, 
Um, there's a huge open education movement in Brazil and a huge demand for increasing access to uh, education there. Uh, and so Portuguese uh, is probably one of the first in the Spanish uh, language market worldwide is huge and actually in the United States it's a real benefit to have Spanish language books. But I think shortly behind that we, we are beginning to figure out uh, where, where we want to go globally and I think we'll start to see lots more translated titles. The license, by the way, allows people, translations are a derivative work, um, so people have translated our books into other languages on their own uh, because they have the legal right to be able to do that and made those books available, uh, but we haven't yet done that on scale. So let us thank Eric. Great. Okay. אני חושב שההרצאה שלו פתחה לנו אולי צוהר לעולם חדש של ספרי לימוד חינמיים ברמה גבוהה, נכתבים על ידי טובי החוקרים בעולם, וזמינים לכל אוניברסיטה שרוצה בכך לאימוץ מיידי. אז זה משהו חדש, ואני מקווה שתיתנו עליו את דעתכם. אני רוצה רגע לקרוא ליוסי, בבקשה. שייתן כמה הנחיות על היכן האולמות, או אלי יעשה את זה, אוקיי? ואני מאחל לכולנו המשך כנס נעים, תודה רבה.